Hi, Year 12. We are looking at our third poem, Read Flute Cave, today. And this is one that she also wrote whilst in China. And it links closely to what was looked at in the previous poem, China Woman. And it is a poem that shows the link between ancient cultures in different countries. Ujuru Nunakal in this poem is really coming to a realisation that the ancient cultural understanding that the Aboriginal people have within Australia is similar to the ancient cultural beliefs and understandings and spirits that are present in other countries in the world and in this case in particular China. So you've had a look at the location that she was writing in and writing about and you've seen how beautiful it is and I think that when you look at the geography of both the 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 town that she's in and the cave that she is writing about you can see how like I guess they're quite quite mythical in the way that they look and they look ancient there's that real sense of majesty and spirituality just in the landscape of these locations. So we're going to read the poem first. Read Flute Cave. I didn't expect to meet you in Gwalin, my rainbow serpent, my earth mother, but you were there in Reed Flute Cave with animals and reptiles and all those things you stored in the dream time. Pools of cool water like mirrors reflecting your underbelly. The underground storage place where frogs store water in their stomachs and mushrooms and every type of fruit, vegetable, animal and fish are on display. Perhaps I have strayed too long in this beautiful country. The reed flutes are playing a mournful tune. The cool air rushing through the rock cathedral reminds me of the sea breezes of Stradbroke and the reed flute seems to be capturing the scene. The slippery earth stone floor takes me back to mud sea flats, where seaweeds communicate with oysters, fish and crabs. Have you travelled all this way to remind me to return home? Uluru, your resting place in Australia, will not be the same without you. I shall return home, but I'm glad I came. Tell me, my rainbow spirit. Was there just one of you? Perhaps, now I have time to think. Perhaps you are but one of many guardians of Earth's peoples. Just one, my rainbow serpent, spirit of my mother Earth. Okay, now, it's important that you recall the myth of the rainbow serpent from the dream time that you needed to look at for the previous poem because understanding the rainbow serpent goes a long way in understanding the references and imagery in this poem. Ultimately, what she is recognising here, not only is there this recognition of shared uh, of cultural experiences for every country in the world that are ancient and meaningful, but also that it doesn't matter where we go, our own cultural spirit will stay with us and will guide our experiences. And so she sees here that even though she is so far away from her home, so far away from Australia, the cultural spirit that is within her continues to be present. She continues to feel it. It, it goes with her. So that's the first note that we're going to make just up the top of the poem, I think. If we write our own cultural spirit... stays with us and guides our experiences. Regardless of how far we travel.
I want you to look for this idea, or we will look for this idea throughout the poem. That's kind of a, a, a big idea that we that we have here. Now, let's, as we've done with the other two poems, go through and number our lines so that they're an easy reference point for us. As you're doing this, you'll notice that this is the longest of the poems that we studied for Udru. Okay, so we have got 42 lines in this poem. It's still fairly free verse, even though it looks like it's got um, a bit of a, a structural element to it. I guess maybe of note is that we have the first stanza and the last stanza both have 10 lines and the two stanzas in between um, are, are not similar. So I guess there's that sense of the poem being bookended in the first and last stanza with that nice 10 line structure. All right, looking at the beginning, the first thing I notice is this use of the personal pronoun again. So like the previous poems, there's that real sense of personal ownership of her culture. And the fact that she starts with, I didn't expect to meet you in Guilin. We've got a personal address happening or a direct address. She's talking to her rainbow serpent. Um, so she's not talking to us as a reader. She's not talking to China. She's talking to the rainbow serpent. Let's make note of these personal pronouns that are possessive, okay? They're, um, we've got this possessive pronoun happening that is, uh, we've recognised that in her previous poems when she speaks of the rainbow serpent. So possessive pronoun, um, that's for my and my. That's just a personal pronoun there for I. We're going to write cultural ownership. Um, and we've got that allusion to China woman because it's the same in China Woman, where she, she says, my rainbow serpent, that's repeated, a, a repetition. And that would have been done very deliberately. As I said, the use of you makes it a direct address. I didn't expect to meet you in Guilin, my rainbow serpent, my earth mother. It's a turn of surprise here, isn't there? So I'm just going to change my colour and go um, surprised tone. And I think she's pleasantly surprised. There's a real positive tone throughout the entire poem. But you were there in Reed Flute Cave. And when we've got this, but you were there... There's that idea that uh, the, the constancy of the rainbow serpent as representative of her culture and her identity, that it's always there and you can depend on it. Um, it's like saying 
you know, to, to someone who protects you. Oh, I didn't expect to see you there, but you were there and you saved me. Or someone who you can rely on. They're always there for you. And I really feel that she has this sense with the rainbow serpent. The And remember, you know, the rainbow serpent here is very much the representation of her cultural identity. Um, so we're going to write here... Um, you were there. We're going to write cultural cultural identity, and values. Never leave. Um, and I'm going to say she can depend on. She can depend on them. Now, here in this next little bit, she is, I guess, describing the cave, this beautiful, beautiful ancient cave. And she says, In reed flute cave with animal, animals and reptiles and all those things you stored in the dream time. So when we look at that, we've got this understanding that the cave is like a world within a world. And when we looked at the information about what it is that we have in... Um, sorry, I just got distracted by a message from Miss Ridgeway. Um, okay, back to what I was doing. Um, yes, the cave. So she is talking here about the cave the cave as we've previously found out is very 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 ancient it was undiscovered until the 1940s and there are um, inscriptions and things that indicate it was used um, in ancient times as a important place so similar to what we see in Australia with the cave paintings that and the rock paintings that um, ancient Aboriginal people did and, and that we still have today. Um, so that idea of a link between past and present. Now, you can see that we're getting all of these ideas that keep popping up in the poem. So our third poem in, we've got this theme of the past and the present and the presence of the past in our current world. And that as a theme you'll continue to see throughout her poetry. So in order for us to make a note of that here, we can simply write um, a world with the... I'll put the cave. So it is a world within a world, a link between past and present. Um, and I'm going to put like places of... Um, Aboriginal significance in Australia. Oh, what did I just do? All right. Now, she's talking to the rainbow serpent here, addressing the rainbow serpent. And she gives the rainbow serpent a um, a human-like aspect, not that the serpent is, you know, talking and um, and acting like a human, but the fact that she has her use and all those things you stored in the dream time. So for an animal to be doing something deliberate like storing things and there's that sense of um, humanisation, we call that anthropomorphism. 
anthropomorphism. Blah, blah, blah. I knew I would get that wrong when I was trying to say it. Anthropomorphism. And so we have the anthropomorphism of the serpent here that comes about through the use of the verb stored, which is humanizing the serpent. Um, so let's write that in a different color. I'm going to write anthropom anthropomorphism. It's a long word. Anthropomorphism, um, and we're using this verb stored. Um, verb stored humanizes the serpent. All right. Pools of cool water like mirrors reflecting your underbelly. Now, remember my little explanation of lexical chain in the previous poem? We have that going on here as well because mirrors and reflecting are obviously words that are linked. So here we've got this lexical chain and it's the simile. So pools of cool water like mirrors. So we've got a simile that creates a lexical chain to the verb reflecting. Now, I'll write this first and I'll just say something about it. The so what here, because, you know, whenever we are looking at how something has been composed, we always go, well, so what's the effect? And I think that the mirrors here reflecting the underbelly, there's a couple of things going on. There's a metaphor that I'll speak about in just a moment. But I think that with this linking between past and present, we also have that idea of the, the mirrors and the reflecting being us looking into the past and seeing what was once there. But at the same time, a mirror is something that shows us ourselves if we look into it. So if we have the the reflection of the past within these, you know, this this I guess metaphorical cool water, or literal and metaphorical, um, then we have not only looking into the past, but also seeing ourselves reflected as part of that past. So. I want you to write, um, or you know, and if if the way I write it isn't clear enough, like if you think I'm not going to remember what she just said or what she was talking about, then by all means, pause after I've written and write it in your own words um, that makes it clear for you. Um, but I'm going to write looking um, in. Uh, into the past and seeing yourself reflected okay so that connection between past and present and the understanding of the impact the past has had on who you are now there's another Thing going on here which is a metaphor reflecting your underbelly now she's metaphorically talking about the serpent being the cave here so if we think of the pools of cool water like mirrors that are in the cave what would be reflected down would be the roof of the cave here she's saying that they're reflecting her underbelly so she's metaphorically saying that the serpent is the cave that the serpent is the, the roof of the cave and all around. And that shows us that the serpent is omnipresent. Now, if something's omnipresent, it means it's everything, everywhere. We talk about God being omnipresent. You know, you can see and hear everything that we do. And so in that sense, this metaphor suggests that the serpent...
is the cave. And from that we get that he's omnipresent. And you might just want to put all around. Um, and of course, you know, when you're looking into that deeply, we've got, therefore, the realisation that this serpent is surrounding Ujuru at all times. The serpent, of course, being her culture, the dream time stories, her beliefs, her identity, and she's just got this omnipresence of all of that going on. The underground storage place where frogs store water in their stomachs. This is an allusion to the Dreamtime story of the big frog that drank all the water that you may have heard when you were younger. I know that play school used to always read this Dreamtime story. It's it's quite a um, it's quite a, a well known one and one that has made its way into popular culture. I think. But so we've got this allusion to uh, Dreamtime narratives. And mushrooms and every type of fruit, vegetable, animal and fish are on display. Now, she's listing those things in the cave that links to the Dreamtime stories. So... Dreamtime stories are, you know, based around nature and and that's, you know, such an important connection for her. And so in the cave, I mean, if you think about what she could otherwise have been listing, like there's a stalactite mites, types, you know, all those things that hang down on the, the roof of the cave and, and then, you know, there's lots of things she could have referred to, but here she's got the listing that links to the Dreamtime stories. Oh. Oh, I didn't know I could do that. Listing. So what if we go listing things in the cave that... Um, Link to Dreamstone. Link to Dreamtime stories. Now, next stanza, she starts with perhaps. And this word perhaps is repeated later in the poem. She repeats it twice in the last stanza halfway through the last stanza and when you use the word perhaps there's a sense of reflection of questioning yourself and so here she is questioning her place um, where she is and realizing she comes to a realization that her culture is drawing her back to her identity drawing her back to land drawing her back to the Aboriginal culture. And I don't think she says it in a regretful way at all. She's not saying I should have left already because she says perhaps I have strayed too long in this beautiful country and that, you know, really lovely sim simple um, adjective of beautiful is very complimentary. And so she's not regretful or um, or anything like that. She's recognizing that it's done something very beautiful for her and of course as we've been learning one of the most important things was that it brought her you know her traveling to China has brought her back to writing poetry um all right so perhaps and if you wanted to go ahead and identify the other two times that she uses perhaps with the same colour, you can do that now down in line 37 and line 38, that repetition. So we're just going to write repeated later. And say, um, um, 
Uduru is questioning herself, her culture is drawing her back to her identity. Oh. Why did that go away? Now, this is important, like this little shift, I guess, in what she's reflecting on, because we're going to, towards the end of the poem, write about how important her identity is as a poet, as an Aboriginal poet, how important that is politically, because she's a voice for her people. She um, embraces that identity. She is in China on a political trip and so she she knows that she's got that authen you know that that authentic power to make a difference and this you know trip to China reminded her how powerful poetry can be in creating a space and a voice for people so she i think when she says I've strayed too long she's got a double meaning here She's not just talking about the beautiful country of China. She she is talking about that. But I think that she's also referring to her break from writing poetry um, and that she needs to, you know, re, um, re, re, not re, reinvigorate, but she wants, you know, she, she needs to start writing poetry again and allow that power to be um, politically important. So... Let's go um, also referring to her break from writing poetry and she's realising that her poetry is important both culturally and politically. And personally as well. What am I doing? In lines 18 and 19, we have oral and tactile imagery that she is experiencing within the cave. The reed flutes are playing a mournful tune, the cool air rushing through the rock cathedral. The reed flutes that she refers to are the reeds that are growing outside of the cave and when the wind goes through them, they make a, a tune and she's describing it as mournful. Um, and I think that if you think about the tactile imagery of the cool air rushing through, so standing inside the cave, hearing this mournful tune that's coming from outside and coming in on the wind, you feel the wind on your face, there's a metaphysical presence to the cave that she's alluding to. So a metaphysical presence, I guess, is you know, you'd think of it as like a spirit or a ghost. And I think that she's acknowledging the spirit of the cave as a place of um, ancient people. So let's write that like this we will go mournful tune mournful and cool air rushing that's where i'm getting the oral and tactile imagery now remember oral is your sense of sound tactile is what you feel so you can feel the wind on your face and 
guys, remember that if you have forgotten what any of these terms mean, and I say, you know, tactile is what you feel, make a note of it in your book somewhere so that you don't forget it as we move into our exams. Um, Suggests a metaphysical presence to the cave. And I might just put, you know, um, maybe ancient spirit in a question mark because, you know, it's whatever you think it might be. Um, now, the rock cathedral, this use of the term cathedral, rock, um, the caves like this are often referred to as cathedrals because that is a word that conjures up the image of something that's very big and majestical and gives you an idea of the the height of it but I think that there's more to it than just that because a cathedral is also a place of worship in um, predominantly Christian culture and so she's recognizing that for ancient people it is these places in nature that are the significant places of the ancient beliefs and religions, if you will. So let's go with um, a place of worship. And I'm going to go, I think it's predominantly Christian. Um, And we're going to say here, um, demonst- oh, what would be the word, the Rock Cathedral, um, I'm going to say it signifies, it's a great word, uh, signifies that the cave is a place of um, ancient religion beliefs now in the next bit from line 21 all the way through to line 28 there is this lovely repetition of an S sound which gives a sibilance that creates a rhythm and it conjures up that sound of the serpent. So as I read this bit, think about that S and the, the, the snake sound that it makes. Reminds me of the sea breezes of Stradbroke. And the reed flute seems to be capturing the scene. The slippery earth stone floor takes me back to mud sea flats where seaweeds communicate with oysters, fish and crabs. So if we make note of all of the different times this S appears, we've got reminds me of the sea breezes of Stradbroke and the reed flute seems to be capturing the scene. The slippery earth stone floor takes me back to mud sea flats where seaweeds communicate with oysters, fish and crabs. So if you just want to write, um, I might just put it here, uh, lines... 21 to 28, sibilance. So remember that sibilance is a special type of alliteration. It's when that S sound is used. Um, and sometimes it's used to create a sinister sound, but I don't think it's sinister here at all. I think it's just that um, rhythm and the, the conjuring up the sound of the serpent.
I mean, maybe you can even see that it's a, almost like a ghostly um, S sound. She's, you know, talking about the spirit within the cave and the the wind blowing through and then we've got this image of the this oral image of the 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 serpent and i think it's worth making note of the word here um the adjective slippery because the slippery earth i think that there's a real nod here to the fact that things are forever changing and moving um so not only the movement of the snake um but also the movement of the world in that it's continually you know time is continually passing and there's that slippery nature of time and the past and memory but it's also a constant the earth is always there as are these beliefs um now when she says he reminds me of sea breezes we have a a theme here that is appearing that continues to appear throughout her poetry of uh memory i don't know what that's meant i was going to make a little arrow there i don't know what that turned out to be let me rub it out um and i'll just do a normal one all right so uh memory and this is her connection to home she talks of stradbroke which of course is a, a place in australia her home And notice that here we've got the cave, right? And that's the connection to culture for China. But when she talks about her memory and the things that are reminding her of home, it's all of these um, outside things, you know, the sea breezes, the um, the slippery earth stone floor the mud sea flats the fish and the crabs and so and you know then she mentions Uluru and so I think that it's more the freedom of Australia's landscape that is her place of worship so we've got the cathedral here but for her memory and her understanding of home it's the freedom of Australia's landscape that is her place of worship the freedom of Australia's landscape is her place of worship. So I guess you could even say that the cathedral is um, juxtaposed to the outside images that she is referring to here so we could even go like this so let's just go um what was i saying cathedral juxtapose There we go, that works. Cathedral ducks are supposed to Australia's open landscape. Um, so we've got, as I said, memory. Um, our tone has become reflective. So let's just go reflective tone. Um, and just a little bit more to go. Um, let's kind of just i guess emphasize what we were just talking about or i was just talking about i'm having a conversation with myself right now um her connection well k 
Connections to home are through nature. which is obviously her connection to country. Have you travelled all this way to remind me of home? I think that there's a, it's a rhetorical question, but it presents the quint, quintessential argument of the poem that experience is good, but home is most important. And I think there's almost a... A playful tone in the way that that she says this because she's kind of you know coming to this realization herself and um, she's grateful for the realization so we've got rhetorical question uh, presents the quintessential argument I mean you could say argument or message might be a better way to put it message of the poem experience is good And especially experience of other she's talking about here. But home is most important. Um, and I think she's reminding herself that, you know, not to get lost and to remember your purpose. And so that refers back to her as a poet, as we've been saying, don't get lost. Remember your purpose. Um, now, when she says here, Uluru, your resting place in Australia will not be the same without you. There's really a double meaning here. She's obviously talking about the rainbow serpent, you know, come back to Australia, you need to be at Uluru. But she's also referring to herself and her importance politically to her country and her people. Um, and so that need for her both to physically return to Australia, but also to poetically return or return as a poet and allow for her poetry to be powerful and, and have that um, place in the political landscape in Australia. So let's go with, let's go with pink. Oh. And we're going to write um, also referring to herself. Um, and her importance we put it in their politic oh I'm getting tired making mistakes country and people all right um so then with this realization this rhetorical questioning and and realizing her importance she finishes her poem in this last stanza with a high modality it's very reassuring with the opening ex you know she's kind of ex ex exclaiming i shall return home so we're going to write high modality and 
reassuring. So, you know, she's reassuring the rainbow serpent, but she's also reassuring herself. And as I said, that positive tone that runs throughout this poem remains with, but I'm glad I came. Tell me, my rainbow spirit, was there just one of you? And here she has this, this realisation. Perhaps, now I have time to think, perhaps you are but one of many guardians of Earth's peoples. Just one, my rainbow serpent, spirit of my mother Earth. And this is a really important part of the poem in the theme of that cross-cultural, cross-geographical connection. Her letting us know each country has an ancient culture to define and protect it. And even though each culture has got something unique about their ancient people, there's that linking that is common and the linking is nature and a sense of belonging. And so with this possessive pronoun that she uses with my rainbow ser serpent spirit of my mother earth, there's that really strong sense of belonging that she recognises is what everyone in the world can feel when they connect with their own culture. So we had already circled our repetition of perhaps. So let's add to that here. Um, we're going to write repetition demonstrates her contemplation and highlights her realisation and acceptance, her realisation and acceptance of the many ancient cultures and guardians. Um, across the world. This um, final tone is really confident and positive. And it finishes with this confident positive tone that is the power of identity. And how powerful identity can be when we embrace our unique identity that is shaped by the past. Um, so let's add that actually. What did I just say? Um, the... I don't know what I just said. Power of identity. Um, um, the need to embrace the unique individual identity. Oh. that is shaped by our past. I think I said something like that, didn't I? Um, and that ultimately, that, you know, big message that we mentioned before that continues throughout her poems is that we have the cross-cultural... Cross geographical connection. 
connection up. So, you know, it's this linking of all of the world's people. Um, let's actually write that. Linking of all the world's people. Um, in that each country has an ancient culture to define and protect it, and we're linked by, and that is linked by nature. And the common out, or the commonality, is nature. Um, All right, and ultimately, Udru is faithful to her home. Um, all right, I think that will do for now for this poem. Um, as we move on through the poems and we continue to build on those commonalities between the poems in terms of values and themes and ideas, it's going to be easier for you to write about them because you'll be able to reference a few of the different poems in the one argument or the the one discussion point if you know you have a question that asks about Ujuru's realization of you know cross-cultural linking then or cross you know geographical linking then you'd be able to refer to you know these two poems side by side and have a a nice linking argument but that's it for now um hope you've enjoyed do all your work. Okay, bye.